just be intentional about what you're doing. And like I, I, I've said numerous times on this conversation, think about what that decision you're making right now is going to do for that child in the future. Raising to be adults for a good example. I see a lot of parents, if their children are combative or they're fighting, they say, go to your room and they separate. So what you just taught them to do is not resolve conflict, you walk away from it. You're enjoying the Conveying Culture podcast with our host, Star Armstrong. Star Armstrong. My name is Star Armstrong. I am the founder of Clever Communities in Action. I am an advocate for the Black community, and I am also a Black woman raised by a single father from the ages of 12 to adulthood. Star Armstrong. Greetings, everybody. Greetings, everybody. everybody. We're going to dive right on into this. Um... I'm going to need you to give me all your business up front. I'm going to ask you your information like I'm the feds or something. I need your name. I'm, I'm getting your fatherhood profile together because as we have these conversations, you know, different people are going to, I think everybody can relate overall, but with the details, okay. some of your details are going to match somebody specifically who's watching this. So um, if you can tell me your name, your age, your marital status, how many children you have and um, their ages and genders. All right. So I'm Edward L. Fairley. I am 36 years old. I have three children. I'm married. I will be married for 15 years come October. And my children, I have two boys and one girl. My oldest son is 19 years of age. My daughter is 11 years old and my baby boy is five. All right. That's awesome. Um, got a nice little spread between the youth <laughs> there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So my next question I want to know, um, Eddie, is what was your relationship like with your father growing up and how did that influence you as a dad? Well, my, I didn't meet my father until I was 12. So I wasn't raised with my father. And even after I met him, uh, I'm originally from New Jersey, but I had migrated to Virginia. So even when I met him, it was short lived and our relationship was more on the phone than it was on a day to day basis. Um, how that impacted me as a parent now? I don't know. I was never, I wasn't that child that, felt like I lacked something. My life was just set up the way that it was supposed to be. So I never went through that stage of, I wish I had a dad or man, it would be different if I had a dad. Um, so I, honestly, I, I don't think my, my, my dad not being there really impacted me as a father now, but it do, he has contributed to who I am now. As a person, not necessarily as a father, but um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think me being raised. I, I, I literally cannot think of a time where I was like, "Man, I wish I had a dad," or I missed out on something because I didn't have a dad around. So, did you have other um, male role models or positive male figures in your life? <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, and and what's interesting about that? is my mother raised me as a single parent and I always found it easy to get her father's day car but I had a hard time getting her mother's day car um, because the father's day cars aligned with how she raised me versus how she was as a mother now what's interesting about what you just said is or the prior question is I felt that I lacked the mother having my mom around but I did not let, uh, feel like I lacked a father not having a father around. My mom was not that lovey-dovey, you go hug her and she's going to, oh, it's going to be okay, kiss your boo-boo. That wasn't her. So when I saw that in other mothers, I aspired to have that. But it was very, very easy for me to find Father's Day card. I never bought my father a Father's Day card. I always bought my mom a Mother's Day and a Father's Day card. But it was very difficult for me to find a Mother's Day card. Okay, so we're going to unpack some things here. The, my last conversation <laughs> yeah, ended up, you know, we, we went, 
Mo- the, the previous ones kind of stayed on fatherhood, but the last one kind of veered off a little bit and it was cool because okay. it was very relevant. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that because mom was playing the role of mom and dad, that that was the reason why, you know, and she had a son by herself, that she felt she had to be kind of tough? Or was it just... I think person? it's the... Uh, I think it's a couple things. One, um... Yeah, yes, uh, it was her personality too. Uh, at that time, she was with the Nation of Islam. Discipline and all that was no joke. And I lived in, I'm, I'm born in Patterson, raised in Jersey City. So she was trying to protect me from them streets and she was no nonsense when it came to anything. And um, so she was re- very, very tough. Um, and, and that was with all of us, not even my sisters. So I'm the baby of, uh, of five, but I was raised with me and my, my sisters and my mom. So, um, she was, I, I think that was a combination of the nation of Islam as well as just how she was and just not allowing me to be, uh, for lack of a better term, a punk. <laughs> Got you, got you. So so my next question to you would be, you said that your father was not around as a positive male influence and that you didn't have others. So what was it in you that, because I know you and I know that you are heavily involved in the lives of your children as well as being a great husband. So what, how, what, what was it inside of you? Because what happens a lot of times, it seems to be one of two ways. I didn't have the example, so I'm not able to do it, or I had the example and, or I didn't have the example and I'm, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not that same way. So what propelled you to be the man that you are when you didn't have that example? You know, I'm, I'm a lot like you. In the sense that I like to kill stereotypes. So I'm intentional about doing it. Um, and what's crazy is I remember it like it was yesterday. When I was, when I was six years old, something in my spirit told me to watch my mother and do the opposite. And I listened to that, that voice. And, um, so my, my upbringing wasn't, it wasn't the best when it came to her, but I just watched her and I did the opposite. But when I got older, that voice came back after I graduated high school, which that did not happen for my mom. And that voice said, see what that got you? And, uh, and I was like, yeah. And it said, now I want you to watch what most people do and do the opposite. And, um, most people didn't have fathers around. Most people watch TV, so I stopped. Most people didn't like reading, so I did. Um, and it made me study a lot of people. And um, and it also shifted my mindset about my mom and helped me understand why it was easy for me to um, to find Father's Day cards for her because she was the opposite of what I thought moms typically should or would be. So it, it just... It helped me to see people as individuals, for one. And um, I always, I don't know why, but I always wanted to be married and I always wanted to have children. And when I got older, I always wanted to see what the product of my parenting would be. Mm -hmm. So that is where my passion and stuff comes from, because I want to see the product of my teaching and the fact that when I was being raised by my mom, I said I would do it the opposite way that she did, or I wouldn't do it that way. So and I wanted to see what that would result in uh, when when I, I became a father myself. Interesting. So you seem to be very in tune with yourself because a lot of people are running away, you know, from from themselves. And so yeah, yeah. Um, and doing everything they possibly can not to have to sit still and be yeah. with self. So you've yeah. been um, in tune with yourself, it seems, since a young age. Intentionally now, uh, but I didn't understand why I listened to it, because that, that makes absolutely no sense for a six-year-old to say, I'm going to do the opposite of what mom does. 
because a voice told them to. We're usually influenced by our environments, and my mom was the only thing that I really had, especially at that time frame. That was either around the time I was in Haiti or, um, no, it was around the time I was in Haiti. Um, so that is what, uh, to listen to that and, and, and take it as truth, it, it just, it, it is nothing but God. But wait, you just can't throw out when I was six and in Haiti. So you <laughs> okay. All right. So, so let me give you all some backstory on, on a lot of things that probably won't make sense to you all. So let's start with my father, why I wasn't raised by my father. Uh, and why I, I, when I introduced myself, I introduced myself as Edward L. Fairley. It's a I'm not a junior. Story, y'all. Tune in. I- <laughs> I'm not a junior because of the L. My father does not have a middle name. Okay. Um, but my father's name is Edward Fairley. My father, uh, when I was two years old, he, um, he tried to kill my mom. He stabbed my mom, uh, nine times in the back. Um, trying to kill her because she uh, decided she did not want to be with him uh, any longer. Uh, he was a, at that time, uh, I think, 15 year minister of a church. And um, so with that, my mom lived, thank God. And uh, interestingly enough, she she escaped when he jumped out of the closet when he snuck into her home. But she left me. So she went back to get me. And that's what got her uh, stabbed. So, um, because of that, he ended up in prison. He was in prison for, I believe, seven years, and he got out for good behavior. So, he he was sentenced for seven years, but he got out for good behavior. The year that I turned six, coincidentally, was the year my father got out of prison. So, my mom would never admit this, but clearly she was running. Her then Haitian boyfriend uh, was going back home to Haiti. So we ended up going back to Haiti with him. So I left New Jersey as a city boy at like six um, to end up in Haiti to get away from my father who was getting out of prison in New Jersey. Haiti did not work. That male experience... (laughs) did not work. It actually left us uh, pretty much stranded in a garage where we had to fend for ourselves for majority of the time there. And after that year was over, we ended up coming back to the U.S. Clearly, we're not going back to New Jersey because that's where my father is. That landed us in the state of Virginia where I am now. So that is the story between me being in Haiti. That's also the story by me stressing L because if you research with all the things that I have going on, books, um, company, things of that nature, when people research me, if they just put in Edward Fairley, unfortunately, they're going to see my father just unfortunately did it again. Uh, He stabbed another woman 27 times face and torso while running a big church in New Jersey uh, about five to seven years ago. So now he's doing a 22 year stint. So anytime someone Googles me without putting the L, they're going to see the big story about my father um, who did the stint uh, or is doing the the 22 years now in prison. So that's why I was in Haiti. Yeah, that's a a very, um, I guess I'd say powerful story. And I've heard it before, but it still impacts me to um, hear it again. So again, this this conversation is kind of veering off the the path again, but I still feel I try to keep it. I try to keep it. No, <laughs> but it's, it's not you it. because I could ask you a, a, a fatherhood question, but I'm going to ask you something kind of based off of what you said. There are um, two things there that I would that I want to know as a result of that. That's a lot to deal with at a very young age, um, and nonetheless. I know you to be a very optimistic person. Um, yeah. And, and so it was a lot to deal with coming from your mother and your father. And so you're mm-hmm. optimistic. But then also I've met people and we're talking about black men right now who may have had fathers who um, were not the best fathers and they struggle with. I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to end up like my dad. Um, did you ever 
deal with that, wrestle with those types of um, emotions? And how did you, uh, how were you able to maintain um, such a positive outlook on life and then go on to be a positive husband and father and um, all of those things? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, I did wrestle with that. Only thing I wrestled with with that was I had a, I had a very, very bad temper. Um, so my biggest fear and the thing that would I would always say is I don't want to be like my father's because of my temper. I'm like, I don't want to be so angry that I could inflict that type of pain on someone or, or go into rage. Um, so that was my only struggle. And to be quite honest with you, I did not lose that till probably seven years ago uh, where me and my wife had that conversation. She said, you're not like him. Stop trying to, um, I mean, stop asking or questioning yourself. You're nothing like that. Um, but Shout out to the wife. <laughs> but um, you bring up my optimism and I appreciate that. I haven't always been like that. Half of my life, I was very, very pessimistic. And I really can't tell you what caused the shift, but people would point out how pessimistic pessimistic I was, but I was very angry. I think because of rejection, uh, had very low self-esteem. And with that, for some reason, I decided to look at things in a positive light. But with living half of your life as a pessimist, you don't lose that skill. <laughs> so with me adding the optimism to it, it made me balanced. Because I decided to look at things from an optimistic standpoint, but I still could see how it could go wrong. So that allowed me to look at things holistically and make an educated decision based off of the situation. So um, in the end, just like anything else, it's a decision and a shift in your perspective. So because I can see the optimistic um outlook and I lean towards that that allows me to go into it correctly but because I see the negative or pessimistic aspect of it it allows me to go with it or go along with it with caution knowing that it's a possibility um so I will make sure that I make sure I go about it with that in mind so that I'm careful in my choice Got you, got you. Um, I appreciate the transparency. Again, I have really, um, I, I, I see so much value in speaking to you brothers and you all being open and vulnerable about your experiences and about your emotions and not being a brick wall and being a model for other men to see that, yes, you know, black men have emotions. Black men are human. Black men care. Black men feel pain, joy, um, you know, hurt, triumph, yeah. all of the gamut of emotions. And um, we as a community have born this thing of you gotta be so strong. And you do. You know, life requires strength, but at the same time, we are all humans. And so I'm glad to hear my brothers um, reveal this side um, of yourselves. Well, I, what's, cra what's interesting about what you say is I think it's stronger to be vulnerable enough to cry yes. uh, or yes, be transparent I than it is to, to, to bottle it up because you're not being honest with the way things are. And, and what happens is, is with you pushing everything down, that's what causes you to snap and explode. Uh, so I'm intentional about being open and honest and transparent about what's going on so that I don't allow things to build up to where I eventually will snap. <laughs> yes. I have done that in the past. <laughs> it's a false sense of strength. You know, the, the yeah. social paradigm that is you show no emotion, you put that, yeah. you know, game face on all the time and you never can be vulnerable. You never can express your humanity to no one, not even yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also a force. Of, it's a it's a, a form of bondage, too. It is. Um, and you miss out on so many opportunities to get help because you try to act like you have it all together. And that's just that's crazy. It's ridiculous. Even so. It is. It is. And we again, you know, we have to define what is right for our communities and what is real. Um, we just talked about this in the last interview and not let society 
tell us what that is. I'm gonna run to some comments real here. Hey, um, real quickly here. Hey, Chris. Um, Victor said he too saw a lot of what his parents did and decided young to do and want the opposite. So you you got a um a a, a, a like mind there. Um, and <laughs> hey, Aunt Teresa. How are you doing? Got my auntie on here. <laughs> so moving back to the fatherhood thing, I'm going to ask you, what are some of the uh, most challenging things that you've dealt with as a father? Wow. OK, so now this is going to be more explanation here. The only thing that I could think of that was challenging as far as that has been challenging for me as far as fatherhood is co-parenting. Uh, so for those who were doing the math in the beginning, when I said I'm 36 with a 19 year old son, uh, I was in my son's life since he was two years of age. I don't do the stepfather thing. That's my child. So that, that was probably the most, that has been the most difficult thing was co-parenting, pouring into my, 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 at that time, baby boy, I still call my baby boy. Um, and, and then him having to leave to go with, um, his dad, um, his biological father and just dealing with them trying to pour in negative things about me, uh, and then having to retrain what's going on with him. And, and what, what, and this, now you might get me to cry on this, uh, show. Is because even at the expense of him being a better person, um, the the attacks or try the trying to make me out to be a bad person just so that it could be the opposite of what it is that I was trying to instill in him. So having to retrain that and go over that um, is probably the the hardest thing about uh, parenting because uh, it's like. It's apparent. I want what's best for him. And to make a decision or decisions just so that you can say that you've done the opposite of what I've done, uh, even at the expense of his, uh, the betterment of him, that that's probably the most challenging. Nothing else is challenging about fatherhood to me. Now that that's a very interesting and touching perspective. Now that your son is um, coming of age, do you think that he's kind of able to recognize himself what was going on there? Or is he still, is that? I, no, I actually, I, I, the answer to that question is yes and no. I, I'll explain why I say yes and no. I say yes because that's still where he would go for um, his influence or even his, his guidance. But, and this is probably what's going to cause the tears to flow. When he struggles with something or it's hard for him, then he comes to me. When he when his back is against the wall and he's about to fail at something, that's when he comes to me. So finding the silver lining. That means he's gone to all of his influences, who he would want to be his assistants, which would be his dad, which is understandable. Um and in and, and the other side of his family. But after they fail, the, he knows that I won't. So he'll come to me for his guidance in that particular issue or struggle. So my yes and no is no, I don't think uh, uh, he's changed in that regard because he's still going to them first. But he comes to me when it gets like, I, I got to figure out how to get this rectified or or solved. So that means at his core, he knows that I'll take care of him. He knows that I have his best interest at heart and he knows dad is going to get it taken care of. You know, I think that at, at that age, you, he's still learning a lot. And, and of course, we want for children to have it um what's best for them on, from all of their influences, but he's going to get a few more years on him and he's going to have that perspective on his own to be able to figure out some of the things that, you know, you've um, stated it, because we do that. You just, you, you get a little older and you go back and you do some self evaluation on what these adults in your lives were doing and whether it was great or, you know, not so great, you're able to, you know, step back and have some perspective. First of all, I understand 
his situation? Who wouldn't want their father to be the go-to person? Right. Who would not want uh, to aspire to have their dad as their uh, their the person that evolves them, or just the acceptance or wanting them? That is what I wanted for my father. To be quite honest with you, um, when my father went to jail the second time, I was upset for selfish reasons. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, I was upset because he and I had grew to become best friends. And um, what I loved about it is I had not been raised by my father for 12 years. Then I met him and I saw that we were pretty much identical in the way we thought, the way we approached things and, uh, and things of that nature. So... What I mean by I felt like I lost, uh, I mean, I, 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 I was upset for selfish reasons because I lost my cheat sheet. He was, he was me in the future. So I went to him for guidance or to help me understand why am I thinking about things this way? And he was able to articulate how he had been in the same situations or why he thought that way and why. So I used him as my cheat sheet to advance me further because he had already thought those things out or been there. So the it was a blessing in disguise, but I was upset for selfish reasons because <laughs> I lost my cheat sheet, but at the same time, it allowed me and enforced me to evolve into who, I, who I'm supposed to be by myself so I get it and I talk to my son about that all the time and I never allowed my wife or myself to speak ill about his father at all um, even when it got emotional and my wife might want to say something I would cut it uh, immediately that is something for them to decide on their own or come to the conclusions on their own I will just be consistent so that when the revelation comes, he will be able to reflect on who I was in his life uh, so that when he's ready to come back, like the prodigal, prodigal son, I'm going to be there with open arms and, uh, and, and love on him like I, I still do now. Exactly. That right there is exactly what I meant, that he'll have that perspective, just the consistency that you and your wife have provided without even saying anything, you know, negative. Um, he'll, he'll see yeah, it. He'll no. definitely see it um, for himself. But I, I think it's really great to hear the love that you have. Um, for him, I think Mrs. Fairly is on here watching. I believe um, she's tuned yeah, in. I, I do see her, her okay. beautiful self. Her birthday was yesterday. All right, happy belated birthday! Um, yeah. So next, I ask you about the challenges. So, what are some of the greatest moments that you've had as a father? Oh man, do you have the time? <laughs> Give uh, me a few. <laughs> no, no, no um, honestly, seeing. Your your strategic approach work. Um, watching my children evolve to who they're supposed to be, not who I try to uh, force them to be. I'm real big on them becoming who they are. Uh, one of my favorite moments, honestly, I'm very different. <laughs> um, you'll find uh, I'm very different. But one of my, my best moments was when my daughter was about seven or eight. She picked out an outfit and she didn't want to know how I felt about it. <laughs> now, that might sound crazy to most people, but one of the biggest things to me, and I think as a father and as a parent, is to make your children and your spouse as independent of you as possible, not as dependent. For my daughter, who always, when she bought glasses, well, what do you think, Dad? And I will always say, you're wearing them. What do you think? Uh, she get a shirt. Dad, what you think about this shirt? I'm not wearing the shirt. What do you think about that shirt, Naja? I want her to like stuff for her, not worrying about what other people feel about her, including myself, because I need her to listen to that voice for herself and make her decisions based off of that, not based off of anything external. So the date that my daughter got an outfit and she did not ask me what I thought about it meant that my teaching had come to pass. She's now making a decision as an individual that's her own. So I don't have to worry about some guy that is influencing her to make a decision. I don't have to worry about me, her mom, or anyone else 
influencing her thought because she's strong minded and she's able to do stuff for her. So things like that, um, being able like my baby boy, he is just like me having the ability to be able to teach him why he feels and thinks and goes about things the way that he does so that I can guide him so that he doesn't have to make the mistakes that I did to learn how to better understand myself. Those are the things that I I love. I absolutely love. And I'm a teacher at heart. So just to watch and see, like I said, the product of my parenting, that is nothing better, nothing better. That's great. That's great. And those are great. That's a great thing to say that you, um, I wanted to instill in your family. It's very selfless because sometimes people want people to be dependent upon them. Um, so I, well, I think about it like this. If I love my children and I love my wife in the event that I die, right. Or, uh, or I, uh, I'm incapacitated or, uh, I'm sick and I cannot do everything that I do right now. I have failed them if I made them dependent of me. The last thing I want to do is leave here and my wife is scrambling to find someone to replace me so that she can keep things above water. That is selfish and that is not love to me. So I want to prepare them while I'm here so that they can do everything without me and then they can look at look behind and have that wax on wax off on moment and be like, wow, he prepared me for this and I don't I don't need somebody to, to fill this void. He's prepared me for this. So I'll do anything and everything for my wife as long as I know she can do it herself. Interesting. That's that's great. That's great. So speaking of your wife, what role does she play um, in, in, in parenting in your family and how has she influenced you as a father? Wow. It's a great question. The role she plays in the family. She is, she is that, that nurturer. <laughs> I'm the hard one. Um, She just, honestly, she makes everything easy for me to do. All the things that I feel I need to do, she she makes it easy so I so it's not hard for me to do what I feel my, my task in life uh, is. So that is a role that she plays. She is the best moon uh, that I could ever have. Moon is up just as much as a, a sun and, and just as important as far as it providing light for people to navigate at night. Um, yet it's slept on. Uh, the importance of it is slept on. Um, so she is my equal in that regard, but she does it behind the scenes to where people there and typically uh, they can be impressed by me or think I'm great, but had it not been for the moon, um, mm-hmm. You wouldn't even be able to appreciate nothing that I'm giving. So that's the role that uh, that she plays. Great analogy. <laughs> Have you used that one before? Did you just come up with that right now? <laughs> no, she she's always been my moon. So uh, and she wants she likes to play behind the scenes. So that's just what I think of my wife at. But I'm saying, was that a, an analogy you just came up with the moon thing right now, where you've always said that? I, I, I don't have any opportunity to say it uh, outside of now, so now is where, where it came okay, out. Like, it was just good. It was really good. Like, you came fresh <laughs> off the dome like a freestyle or something. <laughs> that was real good. <laughs> you going to have to remember that and, you know, like, use that. That was a good one. Add that to your speeches and everything. I like that. I like that. that was okay. a win. She's somewhere like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, awesome. So, moving on, tell me, what do you want um, most for your children? Uh, <laughs> what I want most for my children is for them to be raised by me. And, and that's one of my biggest fears, that I'm not around long enough for them to be raised fully by me. So, any fear that I have, I run towards it. So how do I address that fear? Every single thing that I do, um, even when it's free, I have it recorded and I 
talk about topics. So the things that I might not live long enough for me to be able to discuss with my children, it will be archived so that they can find out what dad felt about that particular thing. So I have a lot of archived television shows, radio shows, even this, I'll make sure that I have access to it, that if we did not talk about sex yet, if we did not talk about this yet, they still can and will be raised by me because they can refer to that particular thing. Wow. Believe it or not. I've, so you're the eighth father, the eighth and final. So you're the second one who said that um, you you do that. One has been journaling since his daughter was um, a baby and she's 14 now. And now he has a newborn and he's doing it electronically. And now you're saying this. And the reason why I think this is so powerful, because this is so much um, foresight and thought that, you know, you men are putting into fatherhood. And again, we're, you know, all about shattering these stereotypes here. And so these are mm-hmm. black fathers who are thinking, you know, uh, situation forbid that I'm not here I'm I'm putting all this stuff out here so that my children yeah. won't have these questions that my um, presence will still be felt and that that's super thoughtful and these are the things that we don't hear all the time we hear the love and hip hop and whatever the mainstream narratives and the black men don't take care of their kids and all of that stuff <laughs> but um yeah. this is happening on a daily basis it's just the conversation is not being had yeah. so we're here to you know push that out there and for somebody to hear this and be inspired and to see you like yeah this is the type of thing that black fathers are doing it, there's just mm-hmm. not a, a, a platform and outlet to discuss it and it's also something that it may inspire another man to be like I never thought about that so let me let me do that but I think that's great I think and it's just so thoughtful it, it really is yeah well I mean <laughs> you gotta think about the media just other people I do not want them to be raising my children. I really don't. Um, it's already, it's bad enough when my children get home from school. I got to reteach them so that they're bilingual, so to speak. Um, so that they, they know what's, what's real and what it is that they need to do to pass that test. <laughs> um, um, so it's just so many things that I want to make sure that they have the, the, the truth about it. Um, so that they will be able to go through life where I have provided them with that information. They don't have to look for it for, uh, from someone else. So this next question I'm going to ask you, I feel like you, you're you going to have a, 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 a twist on this, but I'm still going to ask it. So um, <laughs> okay. are there any specific challenges, strategies, or philosophies you have based on the gender of your children? No, uh, I treat them as individuals. Uh, if you think you have a one size fit all strategy for children, um, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. You need to be a student of your children and provide them with things according to who they are. Um, but at the end, the only thing that I'm consistent about is that my decision making and, and teaching is never based off of right now. Everything that is taught is intentional for their future, not for right now. I don't have, uh, even though I might feel bad that I did not provide them with what they wanted at that moment, I'm thinking in the future. I also raise my children to be adults. So I start with stuff very early because um, it bothers me. I, I, I hear it all the time. Like people are raising their children to become bigger children, to be a bigger child, to be a bigger child, and then an adult. They want them to just figure it out, and that Ooh, bothers me. I'm, yeah. I'm just, I'm raising my children to be adults, so I teach them to be, as I stated, independent, and I, I simulate everything so that in this household. They're prepared so when they leave, it's already, they're already ready. I hear so many people tell their children, that's okay, wait till you get out in the real world. Why would you do that? Why would you not make the real world in here so that they're prepared so that when they get to the real world, they're fine? And I oftentimes hear, uh, you know, I'm saying, well, he needs to be doing this by now. And, and like, he's just a boy or he, she's just a child or whatever. But every single time, and I challenge anybody that is doing this, 
Try, like I said, raising their children, children to be bigger children. To ask the person, well, what is that cutoff age? They never know. Mm. They never know what that cutoff age is because they're just so caught up in their child right now. You are raising your child to be a productive citizen. I do not raise my child or my daughter any differently from my boys. Um, I'm raising her to be a productive citizen. Outside of the fact that she sits down to pee and my boys stand up to pee, I'm not raising them any differently because they need to be a whole person so that they're not trying to find their other half. I hate that statement, my other half. I'm looking for other whole. If someone is your other half, that implies if they're gone, you're not whole. You're half again. My children will know how to cook. My children will know how to clean, wash clothes, take out the trash, understand the little things about their car that needs to be tweaked, whether it's a boy or a girl, so that they're not looking for somebody desperately to take care, take on what they can't do for themselves. So, no, I do not raise my children differently. If you I, I kind of knew that, you know, but I thought that that was a good thing to, um, you know, I, I, I like what you said there. But let me ask you this. So what about the sex talk? Boy, girl. Because right. usually it's the sow your oats, wrap it up. And then it's keep nope. your legs closed. That's my The way my household is ran is if you're old enough to bring it up, you're old enough for us to talk about it. Because the worst thing that can happen is I say you're too young for that and you go get advice for somebody else. I don't operate that way. But is there a that different approach that you have for the boys versus the girls? Like I said, I'd say overall for the boys is wrap it up, you know, and, so, and to sum it up. And for the girls, you know, keep your legs closed. And these two no. entities are supposed to interact when one is being no. predatory and the other one is like no. fighting natural no. human urges. Like what? No, no. It is the same conversation. If sex is brought up, I'm going to make sure that my daughter knows to be protected. I would prefer for her to wait, but my conversation with my sons are the same. Like when it came, when it comes to uh, when you, all right. So for example, my oldest son, I remember when sex came up or uh, I saw him watching porn. I took his laptop, not because I caught him watching porn. It was bedtime when I caught him watching porn. <laughs> Uh, so, so I, and I made it clear, I'm not taking your laptop from you because you were watching porn. Clearly, we need to have this conversation right now. Um, but I'm taking this because I told you to go to bed. It was such and such time. And what are you doing up right now? So we had that conversation and I wanted to know, had he been masturbating yet or anything of that nature? And he said no. And I told him, I'm like, yo, I'm not saying you're not going to do it. I'm tell you right now, it feels fabulous. Uh, but the minute you have that experience, you can't unhave that experience. So, um, it, ironically, it was about a month prior to that, he saw a young lady who could not control herself, and it was because she was high. We were in the barbershop, and um, I told him, I said, uh, remember that lady we saw at the barbershop? Uh, he said, yeah. Um, said she, and remember how we discussed how she was high and she was having a hard time getting herself together because she wanted to fix. And um, he said, yeah. I said, well, I remember when I was a kid, because I started very, very young. Um, I said I was watching a, a, um, a HBO episode and it was about a woman, I mean, a guy who had his first hit of crack. And uh, after he had that first hit, it felt amazing. And he said he uh, he got addicted because he was chasing that same feeling, but he never felt it again. And that's what got him addicted because he wanted to feel that feeling. I said, when you have your first release, it is going to be the most amazing feeling. And you are going to be chasing after that feeling for the rest of your life. I said, and it's going to feel amazing. So if you can hold off on you having that experience of feeling that, I, I highly recommend, but I can't say that you're not. So if you do, these are the steps you need to take when it comes to sex and things of that nature. We talked about protection and all that stuff. We talked about disease and all that stuff. I'm going to have the same conversation when my daughter gives me some kind of sign that she's having sex. 
because the worst thing that I can do is tell her to abstain from sex, not prepare her for what she needs to do, and she either ends up getting a disease or having a baby because she didn't go about it the right way. Again, I, I, I I'm, I'm a realist and my, I, I'm, I'm an opportunist, and I prefer for her not to go that route. But at the same time, I am leaving her. Le- I'm, I'm failing her if I don't equip her to go about it the right way. Now, what I do differently, and I didn't, I wouldn't even really call this differently. For my daughter, if you are a guy or she's with me, I promise you by the time you get to the door, she's going to stop at it. Um, uh, when, uh, when, when we talk about opening doors and things of that nature, I do that for my daughter. I call my daughter and my wife beautiful every day, probably at least three to five times a day. And that's because I want them to be desensitized by the word so that by the time they hear it from somebody else, it does not impact them at all. Uh, my sons, I make sure that they see me opening doors for people. Uh, I mean, females. And I call all of my children. Uh, I respond to them, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. And I do that with everybody. Because, for one, I don't want them to be unfamiliar with being respected. And two, I want them to think that everybody should be respected. Um, so, um, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> you mess around, let me talk. I'm, you're not going to get a chance. <laughs> It's all good though. It's all good. It's all, it's very good. It's very inspiring. And it, again, it's very thoughtful because some people are winging it. And I know to a certain extent, you know, you're, you're learning along the way. But what I like that I've heard from a lot of, well, all the men who I've spoken to, you definitely don't, you know, you, you're learning things along the way, but you thought about it. You know, you didn't just, Boom, like life is happening to me. You had the foresight about, you had a plan. You have a game plan for this. And so if things veer off a little bit, you still had a plan. You had directions. You know where you were trying to um, go with this. You have goals in mind with parenting. And I just think that's so valuable. And I think it's really great for people to see all these black men saying that. Like if you're tuning in right now, I know you're loving this. And you can go back on um, my page to the first one, the first two on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and today. And I will be putting them on YouTube as well. But no, this is great. This is great. We're hearing black men with the plan for their family, for their children, their wives, their family. Like it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's good. It's good. It's not TV, mm. good TV, but whatever you want to call it is good media. Definitely. Um, <laughs> and this is reality. This is the reality yeah. um, TV yeah. or media that we need to be having this right here. Um, Cause that other stuff is scripted anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's a negative agenda. So I'm going to ask okay. you this now. If, um, do you, is there anything that you would say to, no, I'm not going to ask you, is there anything I need you to tell me if you, if you had a room full of men who were not active in their children's lives, what would you say? Mm. I would if they're not active what I would do is for one I would get active and um, I would start with an apology and I say that because you know me I I mentor young men 11 through 18 years of age on a weekly basis Um, thank you and they, uh, they, they, they miss their dads. Um, so for one, get back in their lives. Two, apologize. Make sure that the, that's the first thing you do. Three, do not try to come into their lives and just try to discipline them. You can't discipline anyone effectively without getting respect first. Um, and. Lastly, I would tell them that because this is truth, that they have equipped them to be a great father. Now, what I mean by that is I would I would challenge their child to remember the hurt that they've caused them. If that was the type of child that they had or the experience they had and uh, use that as what they need to do or n- know what to do to prevent themselves from creating that type of hurt for their future child. So really remember and sit in the emotions and feelings that they've had from them being gone as 
the education that their father provided them for how to be a great dad. And to, to just be that open and honest and, and that transparency will, I think, uh, will allow them in. And then I would ask them to tell them uh, and be okay with it um, anything that they they felt or or uh, or struggle with with them being gone and and and, and sh- allow them to share how upset they are allow them to share how hurt they are and, and and go from there just to be open and honest with them so that's pretty much what I would tell uh, uh, a room full of fathers that's not in their lives. Well, that's great. I wish I had somebody writing that down in bullet points because you actually gave them a, a plan right there, like some some action steps to take. So, and and I mean, those are real things though, because anybody thinking about re-entering into um, someone's life, you know, you have caused pain by not being there, and so you you have to be realistic that you're going to probably deal with some resistance, um, yeah. and you know, being committed to seeing it through. And and don't go back if you're not willing to do that. Because um, yeah, it's, no, it's worse to go and leave. Don't go back. If you're not going to be consistent with your return, don't go back. Uh, don't go back at all. Yeah. Yeah. So since you brought up the whole mentorship thing, with everything that you have going on, um, you know, career-wise, all these family things, hats that you've mentioned that you provide to your family, what... Um, what is it that compels you to be a mentor and what do you get out of that? Oh man. Uh, for one, cause I'm transparent. I do it for selfish reasons. <laughs> I'm just glad I have a good heart cause I do a lot of things for selfish reasons and you'll understand better when I explain. Um, peace, 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 peace. Me pouring into these children, uh, allows me to possibly prevent one of them from robbing me or coming home to my daughter <laughs> uh, as the person that's with my, my daughter. So typically when I make a decision, as I already told you early, I'm making a decision with the future in mind. So I'm pouring into these young men in hopes that I've just prevented myself from getting killed, my wife from getting killed, uh, someone in my family from being killed by instilling and pouring love into these young men. I also, my passion and I think my God given mission is to create better and healthy relationships. So if I can get them now, uh, prepare them for their healthy relationship, that ultimately will impact a community which also ultimately we bleed into states and and nationally and ultimately the globe. So if I can assist them with having better relationships, I have created a better community, which in turn fixes a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, fulfillment is what I get the most when I see um, a, a change is made. And I had those type, those tough conversations with them. Like, for instance, being an, an initiator if their dad is around of conversation um, because if you sometimes the dad wants to be around but he doesn't feel like they would want to deal with him because they've been gone so long so showing that you're open um, to the relationship so that they can feel relieved enough to say oh wow I thought she didn't want to deal with me um, that is something that I tell the boys and I help them to see how the, the other person could because I told you I'm holistic I see it I see it both ways I'm not so biased that I see that man he's wrong for not being in his son's life that I can't see where he might be coming from in the situation so I try to give them the whole picture so that they can at least put themselves out there and I let them know that they're putting themselves out there but at least now you know you have the right to be pissed <laughs> whereas you know you, you, you if you didn't do it in, uh, and, and then you uh, find out later he wanted to be in your life you've missed out on time you could have had so um so that's that's I love the fulfillment that I get from teaching and I also for selfish reason because that could be my grandson's child uh, that he ends up with daughter or grandsons whatever so I'm doing that to plant a seed that uh prayerfully will harvest 
some protection and safety and just a better uh, community for the future. That is great. Um, I know that when I put the call out to ask men to be mentors, some of the responses I got, um, even men who took the call and have done a great job. And I, I wouldn't even something I feel that I'm pretty I think I'm pretty empathetic and kind of in in tune with people. But something it, 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 I even heard this from men that I didn't think um, would have felt this way, that um, sometimes they were feeling inadequate, that they wouldn't measure up to be a mentor. Yeah. And I imagine that the same thing could happen when we start talking about fathers and not making excuses. But like you said, diagnosing things, um, getting to the root of it, then yeah. <laughs> it could um, this could be one of the the causes. So what, what would you have to say to that when it comes to men dealing with feelings of inadequacy um, in the realm of being a father and or a mentor? Um, <laughs> you can't give what you don't have. They need to become students of themselves and figure out how to fall in love with themselves. Remember, I I alluded to me having a a bad or a a low self-esteem from rejection and things of that nature. So they have to work hard at falling in love with themselves so that they won't feel inadequate and they know for sure who they are in a, in a manner where they can present themselves in a, in a way that would be loving. But you cannot give love if you don't have love within. So you have to first learn how to love yourself first so that now you've mastered it and now you can duplicate yourself. Um, so, so we're talking about some serious self-esteem issues and you have to get to the root of where those things are coming from by asking yourself why questions until there's no more why left because you found the root of what caused you to feel inadequate or hate yourself when you get to that as an adult doing that it's great because now you have perspective and you can see how that was a lie and from that you can pull that root out and grow from there so it's important that they have some time with themselves, fall in love with themselves before they start to move out and, and do that so that they can uh, fulfill those roles. So it starts with loving themselves first. Well, strong James, sexual chocolate, all those things. I just <laughs> dropped the mic. <laughs> That was a very, very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I agree with that 100%. And so we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable if we really want to move forward. Because in order to do what you just said, yeah. you really got to get um, comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's like you got to get in that mirror and strip <laughs> down and, yeah, you know, buddy. all the little oh jiggly parts and, you know, inside, uh, outside, all yeah. of that. And just, yeah. you know, really, yeah. really do that. But that was a really good answer. And Mario says on here, the better a man loves himself, he can express that love to others. So, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you said earlier that you appreciate my transparency. I'm transparent because I don't care what people think about me. I love me. <laughs> so I can I can say anything about my life because I'm not worried about what you feel about it or what somebody else thinks about it. That's not going to change or impact me as a person. And when you can get so free that you can be transparent, that's when you, you plant seeds that will allow people to do the same and grow as well. So. So, yeah, most certainly uh, that that is definitely and it is it is tough to just be honest with yourself. But once everything is out. And you're free. You are. It, life is so much easier when you're not hiding stuff. Well, good for you figuring that out at 36 years young. That is great. <laughs> that is great. Um, I had another question, but I just think that was such a powerful one. And we're coming up on our hour. So I like that response that you gave. And I'm okay. just going to ask you at this point, do you have anything that you want to add um, about fatherhood or um, parenting?
parenting because you you know people are watching now people will watch later you'll share it with people so is there anything you want to say when it comes to fatherhood um, within the black community um just be intentional about what you're doing and like I, I, I've said numerous times on this conversation think about what that decision you're making right now is going to do for that child in the future raising to be adults for a good example I see a lot of parents if their children are combative or they're fighting they say go to your room and they separate them so what you just taught them to do is not resolve conflict you walk away from it I make my children stay in the same room together <laughs> until they get themselves together and then they can separate them. Mm-hmm. so now I forced you to figure out what the issue is so that in the future you don't run from conflict you address it until you to its resolved so just think about what decisions we're making being intentional and don't make decisions uh, based off of your feelings and how you feel right now especially when you're angry one thing that my life had to my wife had to learn the hard way is to not discipline when uh she's angry or when we're angry because i remember when i forgot my son did but she was like you're on punishment for a month one thing about me if i give a punishment or anything like that that is what's going to go through so now she want to let him off nope what we say yeah. is so now you, there's two lessons one lesson is when mom and dad say something, they're not going to bend. I don't care how good you were or whatever from that time span. That is what was was said and that's what's going to go. And now you learn to not make a decision based off of your emotions because you know that I'm not going to let you bend on what you said. Because we have to be people of our words if we want our children to listen to us and respond to us accordingly. So just don't make decisions based off you being emotional uh, or trying to be their friend. Think about the future of that decision and and make decisions accordingly. And also also just raise your children to be... Go ahead. I was going to say, and lastly, just raise your children to be uh, productive citizens. Don't get so caught up in the gender. Make sure that they are respectful and productive citizens. Make sure that they know how to do everything. You don't want to have a son because you thought that is a woman's job to cook that is trying to find a woman because he can't eat. Like, people are going to be, <laughs> uh, or, or vice versa. <laughs> like, that is so crazy to me to hear these things. And I'm like, oh, so the man is the provider. So while you're single, you can't pay your bills. Like, where's the logic in that? They need to be holistic people. They should be good at everything so that they can take care of themselves so that they don't need someone. They're choosing someone. <laughs> right, right. A complimentary, um, but a, a sun yeah. and a moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah and even back when you were saying about you guys keeping your word and they know that you will keep your word you're also teaching them integrity because in a, a time yeah. where you know I mean people who keep their word you know we say word is bond um, it's good to mm-hmm. raise children yeah. who have integrity and to put more of that into the world and like I said parents you have such an important job because it's like this blank hard drive and you're downloading all this information into this, you know, yeah. clean space. Most and this this can go out and, you know, spew out viruses or it can be something that is, you know, very useful um, to the world. And you you really have uh, so much control as to whether this is the next big virus or if it's going to be, a you know, a, a productive citizen, a, a, a great resource to um, society that helps make the world a better place no matter on what scale um, so and also, also I'm sorry I, I really got to push this in um, teach them to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do not to get a reward I see that a lot and we wonder why these children are so entitled um, like I don't do the big I, I tell my children that I'm proud of them good job when they do a good job but I'm not doing $20 for a $5 for this and all that stuff. They need to be doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Not because they're doing something and thinking that I should get something for it. That's not reality. And you're, and you are, you're setting them up for failure. So when they get a job, they're going to be looking for a, a extra something because they did what they're supposed to do. No, you need to be doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. 
tell them that they did a good job and, 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 and show them that you expect them to do what they're supposed to do. But don't be rewarding them for stuff that they're supposed to be doing. Okay, so I got I got something to do, but I, I really I, I'm gonna I'm go ahead and ask you this final question that I usually ask that I've asked everybody else. I had two questions, one of two, and I was going in this, but I want to hear what you're gonna say, so I'm gonna ask okay. you this question. Looking right. at my imaginary watch here, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, let me give the, the the pretext to this. We know that um, I've just interviewed eight black men who are phenomenal fathers. I am the product of a single father as well as uncles and you know wonderful um, black men who have poured into my life and helped make me the woman that I am but and, yes. and so when it comes to fatherlessness that happens within every community not just our community mm-hmm. um, they right. just like to make you all be the poster children for that but granted mm-hmm. we're, we're focusing on the black community right now so what are some of the things that you feel that you think black men could do to help in the cycle of fatherlessness within our community um choose the person that they they want to be with <laughs> um as opposed to somebody that they want to be with just at that moment uh so in your choice in your choice you should have a a list i call it your non-negotiable list you should have a list of morals values um, and characteristics, not physicalities, morals, values, and characteristics um, that you want in a female. Uh, and and I call it a non-negotiable list. When you choose that person, they need to have all of those things. They can't. You can't have nine, and they have eight, and you like maybe uh, this is the perfect. Uh, uh, not everybody's perfect. No, it's your list. Like that's a perfect person for you. That's not a person that's perfect because um, that will increase your chances of you staying with that person, uh, which in turn will allow you to have a baby with someone that you're going to end up being with. But if they don't have that entire list, which again goes back to you uh, analyzing yourself and studying and knowing yourself, um, then you should not move forward with that person. And that would increase the chances of us having uh, families that that uh, that have the everybody uh, there. All right. I knew I needed that response. I'm glad I did it. So we got love thyself, love yourself, know yourself (laughs) and choose wisely. Um, You know, if if those things were employed by us, by men and women more often, we could possibly change the trajectory of um, our community. So love yourself, know yourself, choose wisely. Glad that I went ahead and asked you that. I want to thank you for um, taking the time to be um, part of this Conversations with Father series. Thank you for all your insight um, and energy that you brought. Um, Great way to close out this series this evening. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me sincerely. Yes, yes. So for everybody again, um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Before I go, what are you working on? Tell everybody about what what you're working on, um, where they can find it, and how they can support you. Okay, so my company is called No Love Incorporated. That's K N O W L O V E. Uh, no Love uh, Incorporated. What I've created, as I told you, my passion is relationships. It's a simulator that allows people to um, to self coach and counsel themselves through dating, relationships, and marriage, so that they can fail and learn and get their experience from the game so that they don't have to fail and learn in real life. Um, So everything revolving around my counseling for the last seven years has been embedded through experiences that I've created in the game so that they will be able to... um, to, to practice at relationships through a simulation so that they can be successful at it in real life. That will be available for free probably within the next three months via app and via board game. I haven't had a timeline for that yet, um, but uh, if you go to noloveinc.com or just look me up at Edward Lavar, which is what the L stands for fairly um, at, at Facebook, um, you can request my friendship uh, there and, and we can chat it up there. 
awesome. Okay, I'm glad to hear about all this progress um, and this movement. That's great. Congratulations to you and your family with that. I know they're excited about it too. Say, I hope this is inspiring you. Again, it's going against that narrative that they like to tell us because when you keep hearing that negative, you will believe it. So it's imperative right. to create our own narrative so you can scroll through my timeline and you can get you some joy um, just hearing what these men are saying about being fathers, about being husbands, um, just some some wonderful jewels and stories in there. So go and check that out. Be sure to share them. Share them all. Share um, and um, share share all of these, you know, with your network, because like I said, we can't have too much of positivity going around. So we circulate Amen. fights and we'll circulate the negative things and we want to talk about what Donald Trump did and didn't do, but put this out, share this and make sure that people are exposed to these things. So, all right, Eddie, always a pleasure. Um, you know, we'll yeah. catch up another, I'm thinking about doing one with black men and women um, as far as like uh, relationships are concerned, like how mm -hmm. we relate to one another um, I'm, I'm probably going to consult with you about that Because I think that's the next thing that I'm looking at Doing here so we shall Meet again yeah. <laughs> Proud of you I love you You Thank take you care so much I love you too You have a great <laughs> evening All right, Peace y'all Peace y'all Peace y'all Peace, Peace y'all Hasta la vista baby Peace. Peace. I used to be skinny and kind of muscular. Uh, I ain't that no more. Ow. You know, I want her to see that image. Like, I don't have no, I don't want to worry about nothing. Ow. And so, you know, like I said, I try to constantly live in peace and I try to keep my son at that, try to teach him peace and, you know, con conflict resolution. Um, I would like to say that um, if you want to change the way you think about life or change your, your mindset, change what you watch and what you listen to. Um, we're talking to everybody, but particularly black men. Um, stop supporting the, the songs, videos that promote calling each other the N-word. You know, I was raised in a home where my mom would tell me that she loves me every single day. And I follow that path. I tell my daughter that I love her probably three, four times a day. I tell Mace that I love him, you know, five, ten times a day just because that's that's the way that I was raised. That's the way that I was brought up. And I just wanted all of my kids, you know, to have that same type of love and have that same type of environment. At the end of the day, we got to start seeing each other better than than what the media and everybody else portrays us as. And as we start to see each other better and start to see each other as brothers, sisters. Just be intentional about what you're doing. And like I've, I've said numerous times on this conversation, think about what that decision you're making right now is going to do for that child in the future. Raising to be adults. For a good example, I see a lot of parents, if their children are combative or they're fighting, they say, go to your room and they separate. So what you just taught them to do is not resolve conflict. You walk away from it. Ow. Star Armstrong.